Hello and welcome to OT, the podcast. We're here to talk about what's the time and how to spend it. My name's Philly Schultz. And coming up the quarter, the third quarter, third quarter, it's... Andy Green, Felix, how you going, mate? Yeah, I thought I'd dip into uh, race calling there for a second. You're feeling speedy. Uh, oh, 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 I see what you did there. Uh, no, there have been some speedy developments, but uh, we will get to those in a second. We will also, in a, more than a few seconds, get to this week's guest... Almost the last guest of Watchers of Wonders 2023, six months later, however, many, however long it is, uh, Pierre Anero, the image and style director of Cartier. He, uh, we had a chat to him. I had a chat to him, I guess. A lot of E's and R's in his name, also in Cartier. Yeah, I mean, very pleasing, rolls off the tongue, mm. uh, almost as pleasing as the novelties of 2023. How's that for a segue? That was a fantastic segue, Felix. <laughs> Uh, what have you been up to, Andy? Anything in particular exciting happening? You know what? I did. I did oh, uh, watch. I watched a movie. I think it was Saturday night. Can I guess what it was? Yes. Was it in the cinema? No, no. It was a. It was a rental, but it was at the cinema recently. Oh, I got no idea. Guess. I. I just. I don't know what movie. I can't think of new movies. Was it an action movie? This is. Mm. This is quickly becoming boring. It was air. Oh, okay. The Apple TV one. Was it Apple TV? I think it's Amazon. Oh, okay. All it was right. on uh, Amazon Prime. So yeah. luckily I haven't cancelled that for some reason. Amazon Prime sort of made it. It went to the cinemas and now it's back on Amazon Prime, you know. So yeah, sure. Shoes. Shoes. Ben Affleck. Sure. Matt Damon. Yep. To name a few. It was it was really awesome, I have okay. to say. Viola Davis, Chris Tucker. Uh, so it's a story about sort of Nike going through that period of becoming cool and signing Michael Jordan as a rookie. Sure, sure, sure. And it's sort of really interesting as far as the angle of the film goes because it's about sort of the deal and it's about Nike and it's not a film about Michael Jordan, which I think is quite a good way to take it. Yeah. I know two facts about this film. Sure. One of them, Michael Jordan only signed off on it if Viola Davis played his mum. Yes. Uh, And two, it was a script, I believe, written like on spec like the guy just wrote it and sent it to someone and eventually got turned into a movie. Yeah, so and, and Ben Affleck um, directed it. Yeah, right. Which is which is also a cool fact because it's, it's cool to see sort of him and Matt Damon obviously working together. We've got Jason uh, Bateman in there as well. Classic, of course. So a really, really strong cast. Actually, again, an, an awesome cast. It's such a, such a good story. Mm. It's such a nice story and it seems mm. sort of really fair deal because it sort of changed the way that athletes kind of – got endorsements and worked with with big brands. It was sort of the first deal. Um, I mean, the big story is that Michael Jordan's mum kind of negotiated a a 5% profit share or or revenue share of every Air Jordan sold. And that was a game changer. Massive game changer. I think I read last year he made 500 million. Oh, no, so it was 250 million US from that that deal. So, (laughs) which is insane. Just just in a year, wow. In one year, yeah. So sports fans will know that Michael Jordan's kind of history and career is pretty amazing, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of lore and interesting stories as is. I want to keep it. I want to keep it movie themed. Um, And this is something that that I thought of uh, this morning while while watching a bit of a cover of a Chris Isaacs classic. Uh, We get asked a lot, you know, in our sort of quasi-professional capacity. Oh, who would be a good, you know, watch ambassador for this brand? Who would be a friend of brand? Like, you know, they want to, the, the people want to sort of get your opinions on, like, who's right for the market, who's cool, mm. all that sort of stuff. I want to know, why is Jack Black not advertising for Tech Philippe? Why is he not on the back of magazines? Why is he not on billboards selling luxury products? He's a... Uh, <laughs> I think Jack Black speaks to you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I mean, I understand there's, there's some other reasons. My real question here is who would be a good brand for it, fit okay. for Jack Black? So, I mean, I, I'll answer the first question because I've, I've a lot of thoughts and theories on Jack Ooh, Black. Sure. He was sort of, he was really big when I was a, when I was a teenage, teenage lad. That was phase one, Jack Black. Yeah, yeah, Tenacious D, all of, all yep. of it. Uh, the Pick of Destiny, what a, what a game changing film. Mm. Uh, so I have a lot of thoughts. Mm-hmm. We've talked about Jack Black before. You know, he's got his YouTube gaming channel. Mm-hmm. He's sort of going off on TikTok. TikTok. He's he's pretty wholesome. He seems to be controversy free. He does like great films. He's very talented. Yeah, you know. yep. All good ambassador. Ticking all he's the boxes. Got all the good traits. No scandals. You know, a bit of bit of salty language, but you know. So I think he's scandal free. Mm. He's 
got enough talent and he's like the perfect level of rich. He doesn't yep. really have to do anything he doesn't want to do. And I don't think he wants to shill things. I don't think he cares. Yeah, 100%. I, I, I think he's, he, I put him in the same sort of category of quirky older dude as uh, Jeff Goldblum, but even more wholesome. Yeah, Jeff Goldblum, you know, is a Prada guy though. That's and and that's where I sort of immediately went because you know I think you can see I can see Jack Black like repping streetwear like or some sort of. I just don't think he needs. I don't. I think he's the kind of guy who would rather find something cool and just wear it to promote it because it was you know cool, a cool person running it or something or it was a good. But this, but I think I I really want to run this hypothetical challenge down. Uh Watch brands like he has to. You know, it's it's a it's the it's a brave new world. He has to choose. Yeah, we have to find a watch brand for Jack Black. Uh, Roger Smith. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty good. <laughs> sure, sure, okay. I was, uh, yeah, I mean... It'd probably be something with flames on the dial. Yeah. Maybe Roger like Dubois. modern speak marine. Roger Dubois? Mm. Sure. Maybe. Um, or what if, now hold with me here, Jack Black has edged out Idris Elba and Tom Hiddleston. Jack Black is the new James Bond. No one saw it coming. <laughs> Jack Black for Amiga. Imagine. Yeah, he, could, he, could, he could probably do one of the LVMH watch brands pretty well. Yeah, I reckon he could do a few of them. I think, I think he leans a little bit more fashion and a little bit more playful because, you know. You think he's, he's, no, I don't know. I'm in Zenith. Yeah. Anyway, um, this is a question I put out to to our listening audience. Please engage with us on social media and or our Discord, which is essentially social media, uh, yeah. and tell us tell us find us the perfect brand deal for Jack Black, Grand Seiko, Seiko. Anyway, anyway, Seiko. Um, cool, yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, speaking of of brand deals and exciting things, we've got a FedEx package coming in a couple of days, which we'll be able to talk about next week. Well, you do. Maybe you do too. Who knows? The ambiguity of the like, like it's addressed to me. It's got your email. I don't know. It's a, it's a whole uh, situation. Who knows what it will be? It's an absolute mystery. You've you've been on a bit of a streak lately. Well, uh, yeah, maybe. Well, you posted um, it to Instagram. You can talk about it yet. Nah. No. 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 Okay. I don't know. It was just, you just you just outing me there. I don't I don't love it. Um. Because what else, what else, what else? Uh, Amiga. Yes. Andy, since we published that, clearly uh, Hedinki Fratello and all the other major media players decided after listening to our chat to, um, you know, uh, follow suit. They thought, shit, OT have broken it. We need we to broke talk it, about yeah. it. Yeah. Shortly thereafter, it popped up everywhere. Everyone Maybe sometimes even before. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, either or. Uh, I think people finally felt comfortable once we sort of stepped out and put our neck out. <laughs> either that or more realistically, they decided that they should probably do, you know, spend more than 15 minutes writing this up and, you know, do some reading about it and research. So, yeah, a bit of some other great stories about the uh, Frank, and, Frank and Speedy that was sold by Phillips uh, and the fallout from that, which is uh, we will link up in the show notes. Yeah, it was sort of – it's it's an unravelling story. It seems – the further details that I think some of the coverage got kind of indicate that's pretty new. So I think uh, we may, maybe we or I definitely thought it sort of was something that they were across some time ago, but it seems to be more of a a recent development, oh. which is uh, which is interesting. But speaking of recent developments, yes. uh, you're making a whole bunch of racing car racing car puns at the start of the episode. Rolex, yep, new Daytona special slash limited edition. White gold Daytona with Paul Newman subtitles. And some other fancy little Le Mans f- mm. tweaks. It's uh, ostensibly uh, 100 years of the 24 hour race at Le Mans, which is uh-huh. a pretty big deal. Uh, current, was it one by? No, it wasn't one by a NASCAR. It was NASCAR car did really, really well in it. Um, two other, de- uh, it's got a 24 hour uh, register, so it can time up to 24 hours in elapsed time. And it's got a little 100 in red on the, the bezel, but. Clear face back pa- as well. Yeah, Paul Newman for 2023. What I do you think? Surprising. I didn't I didn't expect Rolex to sort of do a nod like that, but it does yeah. make a lot of sense. So good on them. Yeah. Price, I think price is high. Price is 
uh, 51 US, which is in the 70s, if you're talking Australian dollars. What's is it? Is it a higher price than the typical yeah. um, white gold? Daytona? Yeah, yeah, that's it's sort of I would have thought at least fifteen, sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars more, and it doesn't have a like a solid case back. It's got the clear case back, which is obviously less gold, wow. but a higher finish on the movement. It's the red ink on the the Sarah Crom bezel. It's it's actually made of something super rare and expensive. And mm, mm, I'm sure it is the. But if you you know a few quirks, obviously the clear case back is the sapphire case back is something we saw in the platinum Daytona earlier this year. The limited slash special edition nature is is also something you know you don't see out of Rolex too often. So that's yeah also surprising. This being released out of cycle is also yep. a little bit of a yeah. This shock. is the most interesting Rolex release in a long time for those reasons. I think mm. I don't know. Yeah, it genuinely surprised me too. Yeah, so. It's cool. I'm sure it is going to be absolutely impossible to get and sell for a huge amount of money. God. But hey, it's cool. I like it. Uh, yep. Speaking of Rolex, though, they've. This is an Australian centric topic. Okay. But every sort of, you know, basically every year they do a price rise. They did one, January 1, the prices sort of roll up and it was sort of just everything across the board was adjusted. I don't think it was a set figure. Mm. But I don't know if you saw this. They put up another price rise over the weekend. Bold. Yeah, cost again, of, and it cost looks of to be pretty consistent across the board, around 5%. I don't know why they're doing it. Maybe they maybe stuff just well, costs more. catching up, I think. If you remember a couple of other brands like JLC, he got in a bit of grief for doing like a 20-plus 20, 20 percent increase I mean, recently yeah. on some base, basic models. So possibly it's just that sort of market adjustment. Everything's, sort sure. of, everything's a lot more expensive than it was two, three years ago. I think we can all acknowledge that. Yeah, so maybe 100%. Rolex felt like their prices were... Uh, they needed to be more enough. in line with where the market was at. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fair. Oh, well, um, I hope you got your order in, you know, or put your deposit down before the weekend if you're if you're expecting a Rolex anytime soon. Another new release that, that sort of has been discussed a bit on the old Discord, uh, Breguet's eagerly anticipated latest version of the Type 20, their historic pilot's watch. Mm-hmm. What do you think of this watch? You saw it? Two two different versions? You have a you have a harder take on this watch. Yeah. You you have you have strong feelings. I have softer feelings. Mm. I think if you're talking about prices, the prices are pretty high. I mean my hard take, Andy, sorry to interrupt you, it's mostly around the press release. It really irritated me. Tell me about it, Felix. What what irritated you? Oh, I was laid out for print. It looked beautiful. Like if it was a booklet that I picked up in the in the in the boutique, that'd be great. But trying to read it on a screen, poor yeah, it wasn't optimised for, no. for for email. Digital adult. consumption. Okay. No. Sorry, over to you. It's a busier, it's a busier model from from Breguet, both variants. I sort of get, I mean, I hate to say it, but I get notes of Breitling and Longines coming through. Yeah, it's it's a tough, from my point of view, my my hot take. I don't think it's a bad watch. Mm. I think there's one sector of the dial that is that baffles me. You're talking um, about sort of around five o'clock. Yeah, hours. so the date window's at 4.30, which I don't mind in and of itself. The date window also has chopped off the register. It's chopped off some numerals. It's got a one of the registers is asymmetrically large. And they've also put, like, Swiss made directly under the date window at the very unusual position of, like, you know, 4 mm. o'clock. There's just a lot of choices there that didn't need to be made to make it different. There's a lot crammed into that sort of sector. Of it. And you're right, Brightling and Brightling and Longines are sort of, you know, similar veins. I mean, the, the Type 20 style watch, has yes. been, you know, was made by a lot of people and, you know, it's it's a historical bar. It's chronograph, it's great. They did, it didn't have to remake the wheel. They didn't have to try that hard there. They could have either left the date off, they could have put the date at six, they could have done something else with it and it would have been a better watch. Like, I don't think those design decisions add anything to it and especially when you pair it with the price it just makes every tiny thing you do to detract from it make it a harder sell like if you just made a straight up you know pretty historic reissue didn't change anything you know maybe if you want to put a date on there do it it would have been fine people that like reggae that want a sportier option would have been up for it but by by doing these things i think it's really it, it, it baffles me. Yeah, I mean, you've got one half of the dial, which is quite clean with the 60-second, you know, sub-marker on there, uh, sub-dial. And then the other mm. one, which is sort of 50% bigger, minutes, cuts yeah. through the two, cuts through the four. 
If you've got the date window, text under the side, the date window cuts into the five. And it just sort of like, every, it looks like everything sort of slipped over to the, that side of the dial. It is quite unusual aesthetically. I yeah. don't know. Yeah, and it's got that big eye vibe to it and I appreciate that, but... It's odd. Anyway, uh, you know what isn't odd, Andy? What's that? The fact that we've been wearing matching watch straps on kind of matching watches this week. We have. We have, mm-hmm. obviously. Artem straps are back. We love Artem. We love Artem's sailcloth straps. We love their NATO straps. We recently got some khaki green loopless sailcloth straps. Love them. I've thrown mine on my brass Helios. Hey, I've thrown on mine on my yellow dialed Helios. Where is it? Maybe we need to suggest collaboration between them. So mine's brass with the green sunbursty dial. It's the Seaforth model. Sure. The brass is, uh, it's a couple, it's 23 years old now, so it's, it's pretty heavily patinaed. Yeah, right. The sailcloth strap with the green is like, it's perfect. I mean, it kind of came on a khaki fabric strap, so we're not, we're not miles apart. But as I was taking off, it's getting, it's pretty manky. This strap's been around the world. It's got a lot of sweat and uh, grime on there. So I was happy to take off the OEM strap. Not, not something you need to worry about with a sailcloth strap, thanks no. to its, you know, no, hard no. wearing nature. Really impressed with the hardware on it as well. Yeah. Oh, are we going to need like some, some bronze hardware though? Yeah, I don't know. Well, maybe not that black. Particular. Go black. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty sleek. Because yeah. it's it's sort of loopless, so it kind of tucks everything under. So yeah, you it's just great. have that buckle. See, this is why I, I stand loopless. Yeah, and mine, it's great. It's just, a, I, I, think, I don't know, something, something about that sort of tool watch and the Artem, you know, sort of really, really goes together, obviously. Um, I love it. Maybe we'll have to do a bit of a sort of a follow-up report uh, next week. We'll have to beat them up or something and see how they hold up under the pressure. Um, Andy, where can we find out about these straps? Artemstraps.com, Artem.straps on Instagram. They're lovely. Support them, support us. Absolutely great. fantastic. We should probably post some pictures of our of our new combos. I'm I am really really happy with the um with the way that kind of pairing came together. Yeah, hold on. I love when a watch strap combo comes together. <laughs> um, you know, I'm gonna say a mm. hard sell on an Artem strap would be a uh, new Cartier Tag Normal. Yeah, I'm not I'm not with you on that. <laughs> No, I don't think I would. And I suspect uh, Cartier's director of image and style, our next guest, Pierre Renero, might also sort of raise an immaculately coiffured eyebrow at the concept as well. I didn't ask him, but maybe I should have. Let's do it. Let's, uh, let's get Pierre on. Mr. Renero, it's a pleasure to meet you finally. Uh, uh, it's an honour to sort of be here in the always beautiful Cartier booth. Can you tell me a little bit about what you do and what your role at Cartier is? Uh, I have... Uh responsibility which is um, uh, let's say at least twofold <laughs> uh, which is style and heritage and uh, the central part is style which means my uh, specific involvement in the creative process for mm. all the, the type of, um, of creations uh, at Cartier and of course when we uh, evoke <laughs> the Cartier style I think uh, the link uh, with uh, history of uh, style building and of the Cartier heritage is quite obvious. So um, to really, really uh, be efficient in the way I I promote the Cartier style, uh, uh, I have to in a, to a certain extent, uh, master <laughs> uh, what uh, is the Cartier style, or at least uh, how it was uh, built all through mm. those years, and uh, with also um, trying to, to understand uh, the vision of our founders uh, when they decided to uh, create a specific uh, creative language for, for Cartier. And one thing I find really fascinating... Um with a brand, especially a brand like Cartier, which, for which uh, it's inseparable from heritage, like it is very, very rare that we see a, a completely new collection, you know, these days. Um, how do you balance drawing from the past and, you know, that long, you know, over 100 years of, of watchmaking history uh, with looking to the future and using new technology and innovating in the you know the design or the technology space to ensure that you're not only looking backwards i think uh, to answer this question we should underline one important point of view on creation that cartier has since uh, its beginnings its early beginnings um, i think Louis Cartier himself, and we have some uh, evidences of that in some uh, correspondences we we kept in our archives, as um, a very demanding, um, let's say, uh, opinion on what 
good design or strong design should be. Um, and um, he, he almost defined uh, uh, what is uh, the strength for a design. First, uh, one, one important dimension, it shouldn't exist before, uh, at least in that, um, in that um, category of object. Uh, it should be original and relevant, and um, also it should go to the essence of a shape. Uh, meaning that uh, endlessly the designers work and rework mm. shapes to achieve uh, a certain uh, purity. Uh, purity is an ambiguous uh, name because Cartier is not at all against the idea of decor. Yeah. But that's why I, I do prefer the, 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 the word uh, essence uh, of a shape, what mm. makes a recognizable, you know, that type of shape. And that explains, for instance, uh, the Santos, the, 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 uh, the tank shape, and um, many other shapes uh, at Cartier. And one other aspect which is very important uh, for, for Cartier is, um, and that composes uh, a very important of a, of a, of a strength of a, of a design, is its capacity to evolve. Mm. So he has a description for that. He, he says a good idea is a mother idea, meaning an idea that can give birth to other variations while remaining faithful to the essence of the idea since the beginning. And um, so that's why when, when, when the tank is designed, which is called now the, the Tank Normal, or since 1922, by the way, yeah. um, but he knows that that shape contains in its original idea the possibility to so many variations. And mm. the history, you know, uh, confirmed that. And, uh, and the, even the recent histories. So that's why, to answer your question, we shouldn't be surprised to see so many ancient, I would say, or original shapes at Cartier because they were designed to live their long life mm. through many different um, changes or variations, adaptations, uh, new versions, uh, all through the years. And effectively, it doesn't prevent Cartier from creating new shapes, but each of those new shapes should obey to those um, very demanding criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why you don't see so many uh, novelties. I think probably one of the most recent strong design was the Ballon Bleu in 2007. And, and we know that the Ballon Bleu will have also uh, a long life because yeah. uh, it corresponds to, to those two categories of parameters or criteria as I just mentioned. That, that, that's interesting and, and I find it incomprehensible that to have such a, a long view of your product lives. Like in recent years I've noticed that you've been uh, reworking or, or reintroducing um, you know sort of designs from from the 80s and, and you know through to the 90s with like the Pasha and the, the Panther de Cartier, uh, more recently the, the Tong Francais. How do you it, that's, it's been a generation between mm -hmm. the original uh, audience and, and maybe the, this return. It, how do you determine when the time is right to, to come back to that historic piece or that c collection? This is an interesting question because I don't think there's a recipe or a rule. Uh, I think it's all a question of feeling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the only probable constraint we, we feel is at one moment uh, our offer should be balanced between yeah. different type of shapes. So uh, when we have to reintroduce or introduce a new shape, we think also that the client should have a balanced you know, possibility to choose among different shapes of different kinds. So that might be, I think, the frame that yeah. we define ourselves to, to that kind of uh, decision we, we, we take. But in fact, it's a question of feeling. We had the feeling yeah, last okay. year that the Tank Francaise, you know, could be, uh, you know, a nice design to, 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 to yeah. work again and present again to, uh, to our clients. And that's exactly what happens with, uh, for instance, in the collection Cartier Privé, of course, which is more narrow by essence because yeah. they are this range is composed of limited series yeah. but we had the feeling that the tank normal was really uh, uh, very interesting to work with and by the way it's no surprise because when you think that the tank francaise is probably 
very close in terms of design to the tank normal uh, version, yep. uh, the idea, because it, it, it has those two metallic parts on top and at the bottom of a square dial. I, I wouldn't mind digging into that idea of you ha you ha that you have the feeling mm. uh, of when this collection is, is right. From my point of view, from, you know, uh, looking at watches in a broad cultural mm. context, um, y I see where we're at, you know, maybe not you know, in sort of in, in fashion and style and, and, you know, in clothing and everything. Uh, let's, let's use the Tongue Francais for an example. You know, e even small things like uh, the, the, there was a Netflix series with uh, Princess Diana, a uh, famous Francais mm -hmm. wearer. There's, we're seeing a lot of return to, mm -hmm. to 90s fashion in more mm -hmm. generally in, in watches. It's, it's part of that zeitgeist. Is that but factoring in? I think you're totally right. I think it's more a common zeitgeist yeah. uh, because we are not immune, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you're looking around as well, I suppose. We, we, we yeah. are, you know, it's it's always like that, you know, uh, in, in fashion suddenly uh, there's one thing that comes out and, and at the same time everybody is going into the same direction. So we are not immune. Our creators, our designers, you know, live in the, in the in same the world. world as many others. So the feeling can be shared by many people beca and, but because that feeling obviously is is made of many different things, you know, yep. uh, uh, what you have seen, you know, uh, previously, and what you miss, you know, yeah. in, in 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 the scene, your own culture, uh, you know, many many different components uh, can be um, the origin of um, one idea, you know, and 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 what I was naming a feeling, uh, you know, th that's why feeling probably I say that because it's very difficult to explain, you know, and the number of reasons why, you know, um, you, 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 yes, you felt that way there, at one moment. There's not necessarily a, a department at Cartier tracking references to no. going, all right, no. let's bring this back now. It's no, not it's that. more, you know, to tell you uh, how it goes in fact we, we we don't stop exchanging the, yeah. the you know the designers uh, the studio head myself uh, the, the people from the, the marketing and the commercial team you know we, we we listen also to our boutique staff we you know we we, we and, and and we share all the time on a permanent basis and probably that helps also to to decide in a more um, easy way mm. and it's sort of Continuing on that theme, the Americaine is is one of those sort of mm -hmm. collections that's been uh, updated this year. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at it initially, um, and I didn't. I'm like, I, you, you play spot the difference with the with the press kit images, uh. Uh, and and the biggest change that I noticed after a while was the dial. The dial is, I will say, I uh. prefer the new version. Uh. But I'm interested in what is your, what are the sort of criterias and what are your goals for improving or tweaking this sort of design? What are you so, trying to do? You know, there's a permanent, uh, let's say, consideration at Cartier, which is uh, the, the, the notion of elegance our creations do convey. And um, elegance, you know, is a very subjective, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's a concept or an affect, but it's very subjective mm. in, in all the cases. But for us, at least, elegance is, is, can be perceived when the object fits perfectly the body. So maybe it's a, um, something that is very much influenced by our origin as a jeweler, you know, and, uh, but it's, it's key uh, in our work to, to create shapes and, and objects. And on, on the other hand, you know, uh, as um, a notion of quality in terms of watchmaking, you think of solidity, you think of mm -hmm. uh, uh, water resistantness, you, you think of many, many other, uh, other um uh, let's say criteria or parameters, and as a consequence, uh, to fulfill all those objectives, yep. th there are evolutions that convey to objects that can be more bulky. Uh, be be then you satisfy the objective of totally be secure, safe, solid for the future and things. Mm -hmm. So at one moment, okay, you say okay, we will do that, with, and you realize that okay the object is not totally what we ideally would like. And the exercise in this tank uh, American mm -hmm. was really to put everything on the table and say, no, what do we want exactly for that kind of model? We want it as thin as possible. We, mm -hmm. want, we want everything. We want everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, 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 we I, want everything. So that's why we review every single yep. uh, component of a watch to combine at its best all the 
the two preoccupations, you yeah. know, the one of elegance and the one of everything that is necessary to make uh, a contemporary a watch, watch, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, let's say suitable for the, the demand of a contemporary life. And and that's it is oh, everything has been reviewed. So, so the result is more in the profile because you, you're right, the dial has changed a little bit, but also the profile yeah. uh, is, you know, reaches a uh, uh, um, uh, let's say dimension which is much more satisfactory in uh, in our eyes to um, to be in line with our objectives in terms of elegance. And uh, I, I will note uh, the other day I, I had the opportunity to visit your your manufacturer, uh, and we saw some of the the testing processes. Mm -hmm. So I am now very much aware of what you mean by up to everyday life. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm not afraid afraid when I, you know, bang my watch yeah. against the wall anymore. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, it's a question of trust. You know, yeah. uh, we, our our clients should trust our objects. You know, yeah. and uh, our creations. So this is a permanent preoccupation we we have. And again, back to the comments we were making together previously, uh, we we think long term yeah you know and uh, and this is uh, the essence also uh, of our of our work Sp speaking about thinking long term another thing that I find really really interesting and exciting with Cartier at the moment is this such uh, an excitement around your watchmaking in recent years and there's such a, a discussion you know the, you know in, in my years of following you has, yeah. has never quite been as uh, as much energy around the brand um, from an enthusiast and a collector and a consumer point of view. Are, are there any challenges that that poses from a design point of view where you need to I don't know, manage expectations or, uh, you know, every, uh, you know yeah. the, everyone out here wants, yeah. we want more of these, we want yeah. more of these, we want more of these. How do you negotiate uh, that? First, what comes to my mind uh, after <laughs> this, this, uh, this kind of comment is that um, I think one part of a desirability uh, for a Cartier watch or for a Cartier in general uh, comes from that idea of um, consistency and, um, and uh, in the policy and in, in the way we, uh, we, we take decisions in what we do. And um, then in a context that probably changes with cycles mm. you know and we have um, let's say uh, gone through a period of you know uh, in watchmaking where the dominant uh, idea of the ultimate watch was something very technical mm -hmm. was something not preoccupied by shapes mm. uh, you know the, the, the engine was at the center of the attention uh, and I think probably we are uh, le let's say we are arriving at the end of a kind of cycle. Yep. Not meaning that a cycle will totally destroy the previous one, but uh, there's now more place for another point of view. And mm -hmm. this other point of view is very much in favor of the, the distinctive work of Cartier in terms of you know, attention to the aesthetics, to the shapes, uh, to, of course, to the quality of the, of the movements, obviously, yeah. this is a given, uh, but to that attention to that idea of elegance and to that idea of creativity and, um, and difference in, in, in a way in, in, our, in our, own, um, our own approach. So I think this is what we see. So probably the way we work Mm. didn't change that much. Mm. But I think the way the public looks at us did change a lot. Does that, uh, does that, fee does that energize you? Oh, oh, we are, of course, very happy yep. uh, because suddenly we, we feel totally, uh, let's say, um, in line with the expectations yeah. of the public. And what, what makes us even more happy is the curiosity we feel mm. towards, uh, you know, our history, the why behind all those designs, you know, and uh, why uh, Cartier did take those decisions, when, uh, what's the, 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 the story behind, uh, what was the logic, you know, and, and, and the history of Cartier is so rich that, that the people I have the impression, I have the impression that people just love it, you know, and to, to yeah. get into that and the, 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 the 
number of questions we have. I, I see, you know, on the social networks, the exchanges between yeah, yeah. people, not only collectors, uh, you know, media like yours, for instance, and and it, it's. I think it's a great, great satisfaction, of course, and it's very exciting. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, it's not a question, but it is quite unique. You have such a unique position in the. The, the the depth and the breadth of, of what you've mm. you've do and what you've done it's um, you could spend your life I'm sure you're mm. you could spend your <laughs> life did, doing it <laughs> <laughs> and and not sort of reach the bottom um, I know I don't have too much time left but uh, I would like to get I know that, uh, these are all in in some way your children I suppose. Uh, are there any special favorites from the 2023 range for you? So it's a very good question. I, I, effectively, I'm used to, to get that question. I'm sure. And, <laughs> and, and, and usually I never answer because effectively, as you mentioned, yeah. they are all children and it's impossible to choose one. But this is your last interview. One. But <laughs> of the day. <laughs> of the day. Okay. 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 <laughs> no, but I, I can confess that this year I have one favorite. Okay. Uh, and uh, Because it's a tank normal. Uh, and for different reasons of different kinds. Uh, first of all, of course, there is history attached to that mm. watch because it's the first tank ever designed in 1917. Uh, so this is something also historical, which is really uh, uh, is at the origin, uh, together with the Santos, of a, of a Cartier uh, vision of mm -hmm. what watchmaking should be. But frankly speaking, I have also uh, a, a, speci a specific taste yeah. for the square shape nice. and, uh, and also for the balance I feel myself, this yeah. is very personal, uh, with all the metal part that, that are the components of a design. You know, um, In French, we, we, we say when a shape is pleasing with a certain volume, we say it's generous. Uh, and I think there's a certain generosity <laughs> in yeah. that, and a certain sensuality so very French. <laughs> <laughs> in that in that uh, volume, in that design. And uh, I'm very happy also that for the first time in the Cartier Privé collection, we present a watch with a metal bracelet, uh, which was, was not the case in the previous years, in the it's six previous bracelet. years. Yeah. And, uh, and we, we, we had in mind uh, at Cartier, and I had in mind uh, a famous watch uh, with a metal bracelet like this that was bought by the King of Nepal. And uh, we have it in our own collection. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something, you know, an object to which I'm very much um, attracted to and uh, yeah. quite mythical. And I think that's why it's my favorite in this collection this year. Yeah, that's a really, uh, that's a really great sort of word that sums up Cartier and maybe a good w word to end it on is mythical. <laughs> like uh, that's, you, you have a lot of that around as a brand and you, I think you play with that very, very well. Uh, Mr. Renero, it's been absolute pleasure to chat to you and to meet you and to spend time with your watches and uh, your manufacturer. Thank you so much. Thank you for your visit and your questions. Thank you. That's a cool one, Felix. Pierre is, seems like he's absolutely switched on and loves what he does. We've been talking about how great Cartier has been for, for years. We're obviously big fans of everything they do and its style is so important to everything they do. So what a great perspective. Yeah, uh, and fascinating. I mean, you know, uh, obviously it is a, a tricky balancing act, you know, having new watches and a very sort of old brand and how you sort of innovate in that space. Um, not the easiest of, of challenges. And thank you very much, for Pierre, for having the time to, to speak to us. And thanks always, Cartier, for, you know, helping us make nice podcasts. Mm, and uh, maybe one day we'll get Jack Black and a Cartier. Oh, a normal. That'd be pretty. That's be pretty not strange. a bad shout. Thank you to Adam Straps for supporting today's episode. Check him out, adam.straps on Instagram. Check us out, ot.podcast on Instagram. If you'd like to email us, ot.podcast at gmail.com. Felix, how else should people support us? Get in the Discord. It's really it's really popping off at the moment. I'm about to share a link about some obscure aeroplane trivia. Uh, also, reviews. We can't get enough of those reviews. Ideally, five stars or more. Yeah, maximum reviews. All right, guys, we'll see you next week. Bye.